Good morning. It's time once again for Truth or Tradition with Steve Rainey, worship leader at Benai Israel in Shreveport. His former experience as a Southern Baptist pastor provides a unique insight into God's Word. 2 Peter 3.16 warned that there would be those that would twist the writings of Paul and fall into the error of lawless men. To seek out the truth, here's Steve Rainey. Good morning. Welcome back. Truth or Tradition, Steve Rainey here. Continue our study today. Hope that you're going to stay with me. And I want to encourage you to invite your friends and relatives, uh, other people, church members, your Sunday school teacher, your pastor. Uh, invite others to listen in. I know that uh, I know that some of you uh, are probably confused and, and maybe a little bit uh, uh, even frightened about some of the things that I'm saying. Is that if if what I am saying is truth concerning the church and how how the church has been deceived, uh, it it can be very, very unsettling. I, beloved, I want you to understand. I remember 35 years ago when I, the Holy Spirit revealed to me the depth of the deception in Christianity. It liked to have destroyed me uh, because please understand at that time, uh, I'm talking about 1985 when I, when I left the church, there was no Messianic movement. There was no Hebrew roots movement. Uh, what what I was saying at that time, I couldn't find anybody else that saw what I saw uh, or believed what I believed about the church. And so even my own family uh, thought that I'd lost my mind. When when I said that the church is totally wrong, that, that we've, we've totally missed it, uh, they were my own sisters. Uh, my mother, bless her heart, now she had, uh, she was pretty much with me because I was, I was fortunate enough before my mother died, I was able to carry her to Israel with me uh, uh, two times, and uh, and she and I spent untold hours uh, as I was discussing things with her that I saw in the Scripture. And my mother studied; she read. I mean, she was she was faithful, and and so my mother saw the truth, a lot of the truth. I don't; she didn't see as uh, as much as I see now, but uh, she saw it. But other than that, my family, most of them thought I'd lost my mind. Uh, and I even began to wonder for myself if, if maybe I was crazy because none of the other preachers that, and there were so many preachers that I looked up to, some of them right here in the Shreveport Bossier area. Uh, many of them have retired now, but, but men that I looked up to as, as great men of God, great preachers. And I thought, well, why in the world do they not see what I'm seeing? And so you really, you really come to a point that you question your sanity, you know, because uh, when you come out and say that the church, Christianity is the, is the greatest deception since, uh, by Satan since the Garden of Eden, I understand that that is an incredible statement to make. It's frightening to even let those words cross your lips, understanding that, that if you're not right, you could one day and will one day stand before a righteous and a holy God and give account for every word and the things that you've taught. And so I want you to understand, I, I deeply understand the gravity of what I'm saying. But the thing that kept my sanity during those periods of time is I said, God, all I can do is go back to your word. And this is what your word says. And I, and that's the thing that, that saved my sanity. As I said, if I'm crazy, if I, if, if I leave this world, what I can do is stand before God saying, Father, this is what your word said. This is what your son said when he came here. This is what he did. This is the example that he gave us. And I'm going to step through that door we call death into eternity and whatever waits out there, standing upon the Word of God in context, in context, and not allowing somebody to twist the words and tell me that God didn't really mean what He said, and that yes, where He said that He changes not, but He did, didn't mean that because He does change, and that when He said that something be observed forever, but He didn't really mean that. It was going to change at the cross. I'm telling you, Prince, I began to see that, and I said, God, I will stand before you, and I'm going to stand on your word, and then you judge me, and you do whatever you want to do, but I'm going to stand upon this word. And when it tells me that you change not, 
that you're not a man that you could you should lie, and that your Sabbaths are to be observed forever throughout all the generations or unto a thousand generations. I'm going to stand on that, and I'm not going to let some theologian uh, uh, use theological gymnastics to try to twist the Scripture and twist what Paul said and convince me that Jesus didn't mean what he said and that you didn't mean what you said, God. And that's where I stand today. And I'm hoping that uh, that you might begin to see that too. But uh, I'm telling you, there's, there's, revival, there's revival happening, and I want you to be a part of it. It doesn't have to be at B'nai Israel. I'd love to have you come and visit our congregation. But as I said yesterday, it, it doesn't have to be there. There are other congregations springing up. There, there are a number, and I can't tell you where all of them are, but I, I know that they're out there. Uh, there are a number of them springing up in homes where people, because their church uh, uh, doesn't want to move, uh, uh, move to uh, observing Shabbat and observing the the uh, Moedim, the appointed times of our Father, there are there are small groups breaking out all over Shreveport, Bossier, where people are meeting in their homes, and they will meet on Friday night and usher in Shabbat, and and they're trying to learn what the Father wants us to do. None of us, <laughs> none of us, uh, know. We've been in the pig pen so long that uh, uh, we're just trying to find our way home. And I've said this over and over again. I, I repeat it. When you read the story of the prodigal son, uh, what Yeshua was saying, he said, the kingdom, of, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man who had two sons. Now, these two sons that, that the Messiah is talking about is Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom of Israel rebelled against God. They, they did the same thing the Christian church is doing and uh, still naming God, still saying they loved God, professing their love for God, but, but also putting up the altars of Moloch and Baal and, and forsaking uh, his Moedim. They would not go to Jerusalem three times a year as they were commanded to do when the temple stood because uh, Jeroboam didn't want his people going down to Jerusalem. So he set up altars in the northern kingdom. They were finding ways to not do what God had said to do. But they still love God, they said. And so uh, the northern kingdom of Israel, God sent prophet after prophet to them, warning them that if they didn't repent, that he was going to destroy them. And ultimately, you know that he sent the Assyrian army, and they carried the northern ten tribes of Israel away and scattered them to every nation under heaven, to the four corners of the earth. But God promised that he was going to redeem them, that he was going to bring them back to him in the last days. What we refer to as the fullness of the Gentiles would become in. And so the, the story of the prodigal son, that's what, that's what the Messiah was talking about. And uh, he said that the, the prodigal son would come to himself in the pig pen. He wasted his inheritance, starving to death, would have eaten the husks that the swine, the pigs ate, but nobody would give to him. And he comes to himself and he says, Look, you know, even the servants in my father's house live better than this. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to return to my father's house and tell him, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me as one of your hired servants. And he climbed over the fence and headed home. Now, what I'm trying to get you to picture today is that this is this is what God is doing in these last days, and He's been been working at it for the last two thousand years because we've been in the last days for the last two thousand years. Understand that a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Peter Peter told us this. We're told we're told throughout Scripture. Now, so. What God is doing has been calling the Gentiles out. Started with the Apostle Paul being the apostle to the Gentiles. And we find that the Gentile church, those who came, former Gentiles who came into the ecclesia, joined themselves with Israel. We've done exactly what the northern kingdom did. We have forsaken God's commandments because we've had a Satan using his uh, emissaries, his preachers, his teachers to lie to us and tell us that we don't have to do what the Father said anymore. 
And so we found ourselves in this situation where we're starving spiritually. But now what is happening is that people are coming to themselves. Now, I won't, I'm i going to tell you, there's not anything in Scripture says this, but I believe that when, when, when that young man in the pig pen came to himself, I don't believe that that was of his own doing. I believe that that was the spirit, the ruach of, of, of God was moving on his heart, and he was examining his situation and said, you know, th- this is crazy. Why are, we, why are we in this situation where we have no power and, and, and we're starving and uh, we're, we're, we're not living as sons of God, as children of God in this world? And he said, I'm going to go home. And that is what is happening right now all over the world. God is pouring out his spirit and people are coming to themselves and saying, this is insanity. We keep trying to work it up in the flesh. We keep trying to make something happen. And and they're coming to themselves and saying, I don't know whether my father accepts me or not, but I'm going to go to him and tell him, I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. Just make me as a hired servant. And they're heading home. And I want you to understand that I tell, I tell our congregation at B'nai Yisrael all the time, we don't have all the answers I see us uh, as a as a group of people that Satan has bruised us. He has broken us. We have we are uh, we're like a, a a ragtag army that is on crutches and limping. Some of us missing limbs. Uh, we just we've just we we, we look like uh, uh, we have been totally destroyed by the enemy. But we're helping one another. We're putting our arms around those that are missing a leg or a limb or on crutches. And we're trying to help one another as all of us trying to find our way back to our father's house. To leave Babylon. To leave the confusion that is Christianity. And I think I said that yesterday. Babylon means confusion. And there is nothing more confusing than Christianity. And who did that? It's not God. God is not the author of confusion. That's what our scripture tells us. So if God is not the author of this confusion that is Christianity, who do you think would the author be? It is Hasatan. It is Satan. What he wants to do is to confuse the issue. It would be so easy if everything was just black and white. If on one side you see white, you see God's righteousness and God's truth and God's direction. And on the other side, you see evil and ungodliness and the debauchery and the stuff that is in the world. If if those were the two choices that the world had, it would be very easy for most to choose the light. So what does the devil do? He doesn't want to just give us two choices. We've got 42,000 choices. There are, you know, uh, different denominations and all in Christian sects that you can, and, and when I said sex, S-E-C-T-S, not S-E-X, uh, but uh, these, these sects of Christianity, I'm told that there's 42,000 of them. Now, my dear friend, listen to me. How can that be? Which one is Right. They can't all be right. The only thing that they all have in common is that they all believe in Jesus. That's why I say over and over again, it, believing in Jesus is not enough. The devils believe. The demons believe. They believe any more than you do, my friend, because they've talked to him face to face. You've never talked to him face to face. So you believe in Jesus But if you don't believe Jesus, if you don't believe the Messiah, your faith is dead. Without works, your faith is dead. It means nothing. And that works is obedience. That is, you you seek to obey what he's told us to do. Not to be a child of God, but because you are a child of God. Not to be saved, but because you are saved. And so what is happening is, is, is like the prodigal son. He was still the son of his father in the pig pen. It's just that he was without the blessing to the father. But he still, he still believed in, in God. He was, still, he was still a son of the father. He was just out of fellowship. And this is where the church is today. If you've been saved, you're still the father's child. But you're out of fellowship. 
And we only get that fellowship by returning to his house and seeking to be obedient to his instructions and what he's told us to do. This is so clear to me, and I don't know why uh, so many people have a hard time seeing this. But if that's the case, and by the way, where Israel, the northern kingdom, is the prodigal son, the one that left the house, I want you to understand that Judah, uh, the one you refer to as the Jews, the southern kingdom, they're the ones that stayed home. God did not divorce the southern kingdom of Judah. He divorced Israel, the northern kingdom, in Jeremiah chapter 3. But Judah, and then Judah had messed up as much as Israel did. Judah was uh, the wicked sister that, that uh, uh, played the whore also. But God did not divorce Judah because there was to, always to be that throne of David there. And God could not divorce uh, Judah and still bring the Messiah because the Messiah would come through the tribe of Judah. So Judah is the one that stayed home. That is, that Judah has, where they've, they've not been right with God in spirit, they don't recognize the Messiah. Part of it's because they've been blinded until God called his prodigal son home. But uh, Judah has kept the Sabbath. The Jews are the one people that have kept the Sabbath of God for all of these years. If it wasn't for the Jews, the Sabbath and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Moedim or our father's appointed times would totally be lost to history. But the Jews, as, as many mistakes as they've made, and as wrong as they have been about a lot of things, Judah is the son that has stayed home and has kept the Sabbath, has kept the light of the one true God before the world, and they have, they have endured unbelievable persecution because of it. And yes, they've been wrong about a lot of things, but they are the ones that have stayed home. And so... What is happening now is that the prodigal son is coming back as we're coming back and the Gentiles, uh, we've been scattered among the Gentile nations. We're coming back now to observe the Sabbath and to observe the dietary laws, to observe our father's Moedim. We are, do, we are to do what Paul said in Romans that the, the, the Gentile church would do, and that is to provoke the southern kingdom Judah to jealousy. And that's, that's what's happening now. And so as we come back, not because we've got all the answers, we know that we don't have all the answers, but we're looking for them. We're looking to do what our Father commands us to do. And my dear friend, I want you to understand this, that starts with observing the Sabbath. You need, you need to run from Sunday worship. Now, Understand, I have preachers tell me, oh, well, I worship God every day. <laughs> okay. It's okay for you to worship God on Sunday or the first day of the week. I don't like to use the word Sunday. That's given to us by pagans, and, uh, and, and, and Sunday is in honor of the sun god Baal and his wife Ishtar, Easter. But if you want to worship God on the first day of the week, second day of the week, third day, yes, you can worship God and you should worship God all the time. But you do not forsake his Sabbath. You do not forsake his Sabbath. And his Sabbath is the seventh day. And so I want to encourage you, if you're, if you're wanting to begin to turn back to God and to hear from the Holy Spirit, to have the Spirit speak to your heart and, and give you truth, you need to begin with the Sabbath. And that is that begins at sundown on Friday and continues until sundown on Saturday. Now, you say, well, Steve, if I was going to start observing the Sabbath, what would I do? Just rest. You, you, you can search the scripture all you want. You won't find a whole lot of instruction about how to observe the Sabbath or what you do. It's just that you cease from work and you rest. There, there are some people that uh, they want to uh, uh, just study the Bible all day, stay in the house. You, you can do that. Uh, but don't let the traditions of men, uh, uh, whether it be Jewish traditions or even, even in the Messianic movement, we have, we have disagreements. Look, you observe the Sabbath, uh, but cease from all your work. But don't make it a, don't, don't make it a, a burden. God wants you to rest in him and knowing that he is our sufficiency. 
if we just walk in obedience to him, that we are children of the living God. And on Saturday, uh, or, or the, the seventh day, beginning at sundown on Friday, we just cease work. And it ought to be a time where your family comes together. And as a family, you usher in the Sabbath, and we just cease from all of our labors. Some of our people light candles on Friday night. Uh, if you want to light candles, that's great. But it, there's no commandment for you to light candles. That's tradition. All tradition is not bad. Tradition is only bad as, as when it comes in and, and causes you to do something contrary to what the Word of God tells us, like worshiping on Sunday. That's tradition. And if Sunday replaces our Father's Sabbath, then yes, that is absolutely that is absolutely rebellion. It's as a sin of witchcraft. But but uh, if you want to light candles on the Sabbath, you can do that. Uh, you don't have to. You light one candle, two candles, six candles. It doesn't make any difference. You do what you want to do there, uh, but just don't make it. Uh, a, a salvation issue, and don't think that your brothers and sisters uh, who are observing the Sabbath in their home have to do it exactly like you do. This is what Paul was saying in, in Ephesians, to let no man judge you with respect to the Sabbath or a holy day or a, or a new moon. Uh, you, you do what you feel that you want to do as long as you're obeying the Father and ceasing from your labors. You rest. And, uh, of course, what we find in the New Testament is because the synagogue had sprung up out of the Babylonian captivity, they brought that back with them. We find that, that the synagogue service had been established in, in, in New Testament days, and Yeshua and Paul and all of those went to the synagogues on the Sabbath. They thoroughly went to the synagogues. But... In the Hebrew faith and, and, and what our Father established, it's and, and I, I encourage people to go and fellowship, as, uh, as Hebrew says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Now, what may surprise some of you is that word assembling there in the Greek is sunagegi. It is the synagoguing of yourselves together. But today, because of, of the twisted teaching that we've had in Christianity for 1,800 years, a lot of people hear the word synagogue and say, oh, no, that's Jewish. The word synagogue simply means an assembly of believers, okay? And so I, I believe that you should fellowship and, and join with others. But uh, uh, the faith that our Father gave us is a faith of the home, it ought to be centered in your home. You don't need a preacher or should not allow some preacher uh, to uh, uh, to direct everything that you do in your walk with God. Yes, come together and have teachers that, that uh, can can take you deeper into the Word. But my friend, you as a, if, 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 as a man or a woman out there, if you're by yourself today, what you should do is you should lead your family to... Uh, sit down at a Sabbath meal on Friday evening as the sun goes down and and say that you're going to usher in the Sabbath, and that is that you're going to sanctify the Sabbath. The word sanctify means that you just keep it separate from the other six days. You don't do the things that you do on the other six days. You don't mow your grass on the Sabbath. You don't go to work on the Sabbath. You you. It's a day that is sanctified or set apart from all the other days of the week and usher that in as a family. And if you say, well, we don't know how to do it, just start doing the best you can. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is the great news of the gospel is the Messiah has taken the curse, that is uh, the disobedience and our failures to obey God's commandments. He's taken the curse of the law. Because the curse was the death penalty for disobedience to our Father's commandments. Yeshua has absolutely taken that and nailed it to his cross. So you're free to just do the best you can, and the Father will love you as long as you're doing what you can, and then his Spirit will lead you if there's something he wants you to do different from what you're doing. As you begin to walk in it, he will lead you in that direction. But I'm telling you, you will begin to have a love for the Father like you've never had as you begin to be obedient to His commandments. I'm just telling you, it, it's, 
it's it's joy if you if you come to the point and understand don't worry about how you're doing it it's not the how this is this is what the rabbinic traditionalists had done uh, they made it all about the how it's not the how it's the why it's the why are you going to do it so if if you're going to begin to to start observing the Sabbath and I pray that you will is it don't don't get hung up on the how to do it focus on the why you are doing it you're doing it because it is important to your father and it's his commandment that we hallow the Sabbath, that we keep it separate from the other days. Just start there and don't get hung up on the how-to. <laughs> I'm just, oh, it, it, it's, so, it's so simple, and I'm telling you, it will bring joy to your life. I'm going to be out of time. i got about uh, two and a half minutes left in, in this session today. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to start uh, back about how we got to this point. If you say, Steve, we're so far away from what God wants us to do. How in the world did we get here? Uh, and I'm, I'm going to begin to deal with that. And I'm, I'm going to show you some things in your Bible that ought to cause you to question everything that Christianity has taught you. Now, And I don't want that to frighten you. I don't want it to concern you. I want you to understand your father loves you. And if he's calling you out of that, he's not calling you out to be by yourself. He's calling you out so that he can fellowship with you. It's what Yeshua said in Revelation 3.20 we talked about uh, yesterday, that, that if you'll open the door and come out where he is, he said, I will dine with you and you with me. So you're not going to be by yourself out there. You're going to find that the Holy Spirit will love you and, and, and you will feel the arms of God come around you as you begin to seek to be obedient to his commandments, not to be saved, but because you are saved, not to be his child, but because you are his child and you just want to please your father. That's the way you love the father. Yeshua said when asked, what is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy might. How do you love the Father? How do you love him, friend? By saying, Father, I want to please you. I may not know exactly what you want me to do, and I may not know exactly how to do it, but I want you to know, Father, that I want to please you. And if you will just direct me, if you will just show me, I am willing to leave all tradition I'm willing to leave those things that are contrary to your word. Open the door. Come out where he is. And I promise you, it's, it's, he's not going to beat you up about the how you do it. As long as he sees in your heart the why you're doing it. That you're doing it because you want to please him and be an obedient child. This is, to me, this is so clear. And I pray, I pray that God will open your eyes to it. And uh, you will lead your church to begin to walk in the commandments. And if they don't, then I encourage you to leave your church. Out of time here today. I'm going to be back tomorrow. We'll continue. Like I say, I'm going to start showing you how the church got so far off and how we can find our way back. Until then, Shalom Aleichem. May God bless you. Stay in the Word. You've been listening to Steve Rainey, worship leader at Benai Israel in Shreveport. For more information and worship times, visit Benai Israel Shreveport on Facebook. That's B-N-A-I Israel Shreveport on Facebook. Or T-T-R at startmail.com. That's T-T-R at startmail.com.